Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show this week, we've got loads of tech news. So much, in fact, I've had to cut a load of it out just to fit it in the show. There's stuff from POC, there's stuff from Formula, there's all sorts of cool bits and pieces in there. Some amazing bike cave entries from you guys. You guys are really stepping it up. And of course, all the other regulars. So straight into tech news, and we've got loads of stuff this week. So first up is the new POC helmets and goggles. Now when we were at Eurobike last year, we checked out the new spin technology stuff that was forthcoming for them. And this is a padding system that goes on the inside of the helmets, and it's to help prevent injuries from rotational injuries or oblique injuries, which is basically it enables the helmet to move in relation to the head, so it doesn't cause any additional trauma when you fall off your bike, which of course, as we all know, is inevitable. Now this new technology is available on several of their helmets now, it's on the Octal Cross Country helmet, it's on the Tectal Race helmet, so it's now known as the Tectal Race Spin, and on the Corin Air as the Corin Air Spin. But also, there's a brand new helmet, the Corin Air Carbon Spin. Now this thing is twice the price of the regular Corin Air, and it is just stunning. So this thing is an absolute weapon, check this out on the screen now. So this helmet retails for about 450 euros. Uh, the regular Corin Air Spin retails for 290 euros, so that's very good value. Now the helmet itself weighs 1,070 grams. So just to put that into perspective, the Troili D3, another popular carbon helmet on the market, they're about 1,125 grams, give or take. So it's a lot lighter than that. It's got the spin rotational protection built into it. It's got an all day comfort with loads of ventilations on it. There's 20 vents and internal channels to help keep airflow moving around your head and keep you comfortable. Now it's also got a multi-impact EPP liner, so for multiple impacts within a crash. So this is a really, really protective bit of kit. Now to go along with that, there's also the new Aura goggles. Now these have got ultimate vision from Carl Zeiss lenses and they've got a brand new lens called the Clarity and it's the Aura Clarity Goggle. Now this particular lens enhances browns and greens in particular and what that does is aims to pick out detail in the shadows if you're riding in dappled light and really to help you pick out trail detail. It's designed specifically for mountain biking and I cannot wait to see how these work. We're gonna be taking a good look at those Aura goggles soon. We've got some incoming from POC as we speak and we're also gonna be checking out that brand new Corin Air Carbon Spin Helmet. Keep an eye out for that on the GMBN Tech channel soon. Infamous motoring tyre company Goodyear have finally made it into the cycling world. Now they're doing a whole range of different tyres, they're doing a road range of tyres, they're doing commuter range of tyres, and of course mountain bike tyres. Now within that range they've got tyres for cross country, for trail and enduro, and also for downhill. Now there's a few different compounds, they've got Dynamic Pace 60, that's their fastest compound, Dynamic AT, Dynamic RT and Dynamic RST, which of course at that end of the spectrum is the softest compound, the more aggressive one. There's three casing options, there's standard single ply, enduro one and a half ply and downhill two ply, real thick casing on that. The XC tire is called the Peak, that's the one on the screen now, it's available in 27 and a half and 29 inch versions, it's a very fast rolling tire. Next up is their Enduro all mountain tire called the Escape, that's available in 27 and a half, 29 inch versions, 2.4 and also the wide trail size to 2.6, so get that extra volume and extra grip there. And there's two sort of tyres focused towards downhill and enduro. There's the Newton and the Newton ST. The Newton is their drive focus, so a bit more of a rear tyre. Got a slightly lower profile tread, but more of a paddle design on the central tread there. Really big, aggressive shoulders on it. And again, it's available in 27.5 and 29, in both 2.4 and 2.6. The Newton ST is the more aggressive of the two. Better as a front tyre or if you need more braking control as a rear tyre as well. And that's also available in 27.5, 29, 2.4 and 2.6. And they are in the more aggressive compounds as well. It's going to be really interesting to see their stuff. Neil and I are off to see Otter soon and we're going to be going and checking those tyres out in the flesh as well as some more stuff that they have to show us too. Now everyone must have heard of Danny McCaskill, absolute superstar in the world of trials and street riding. Now Danny's been riding for Santa Cruz bikes for some time and also for trial specific company Inspired. But now he's got a brand new carbon fibre, full carbon and it's a complete one off trials bike, specially made for him. Now there's a fantastic story on the Santa Cruz website documenting the whole concept all the way through to production of this frame and all the prototypes they went through in order to make it strong enough for him. 
you know, and he did manage to break some of the stuff in the early days. But what I find really interesting about this new bike is, A, it's four pounds lighter, the whole bike that is, than his previous bike. So that must have taken some serious adjustment to get used to. He said that the, a lot of that weight was actually off the front of the bike, like the forks and the front end. So a lot of his tricks are very back wheel focused. You think how much that's gonna interfere with his weight distribution, the way he rides the bike. But also, I was speaking to Martin Ashton about this and Martin doesn't think the carbon's a very good material for trials bikes because trials bikes do get abused. They hit concrete hard a lot of the time and quite a lot of the time when riders are trying new tricks or new gaps and stuff, they're gonna have to bail out and send the bike off on its own while they sort of figure out a way to not get injured. Now, fortunately, as a result of that, trials bikes are subject to getting damaged from impact as opposed to just snapping in half from the impact of hitting the ground. And this particular one has got a braided carbon. So that's a really robust, aggressively sort of finished carbon on it, specifically to help dissipate those sort of impacts from that. Now, I think now we might see some more of this sort of carbon weave stuff coming into carbon manufacturing, but have a look at the full story on this bike. It's really interesting. They go into all the details of how they made this bike for Danny and even sort of some hacks they had to do to repair some cracks on the go by using Danny's oven at home, or I think it was in an Airbnb house, and putting some tinfoil over the edge to make a curing oven to fix it. Really, really good bit of interesting knowledge there. Yeah? Check it out. I often refer to formula on the show, and in particular, the Selva Enduro fork. Now, that fork really appeals to me. It looks really good. It's got a lot of adjustment built into it. It's got really beautifully made adjustment dials on the top there. Now, they're back in the news this week because so they've got a brand new air volume spacer system, which they say they've been working on since 2011. So they've really re spent their time refining this. To the eye, this thing just looks like an elastomer, which we used to see on suspension forks back in the day. But we know from what they've told us that it is a closed cell material, so a closed cell foam. And the idea of these is that with a regular volume spacer, so they're made of solid plastic usually, they screw to the inside of the fork, you can have two or three in there or whatever amount you need for your particular requirements. And at the end of the stroke of travel, the fork ramps up significantly. Now, if you like to afford to be quite progressive like I do, you can find that that ramp at the end can be quite significant. So you actually feel it quite hard, almost a bit like a damping spike. Now, what Formula are saying is that the fork is a more linear feel. So have a look on the screen at the moment. They say it's a more linear curve using all of the adjustment travel. Now, if you look at that graph, you'll see a fork with volume spaces, and then you'll see the curve of the their new system, which they call Neopos. And Neopos, they say it stands for a new positive or new positive air technology. Now, they also show the difference between running no volume spaces, traditional volume spaces, and the new Neopos volume spaces. Now, have a look at the fork under compression here. With volume spaces in there, you're looking at 100, 260, and then 400. So the air is actually sort of increasing quite significantly, and obviously it's more progressive. Now, with the Neopos, as you go through the stroke, the actual Neopos volume spaces, they actually compress themselves at a different rate to the air in there. So you're looking at 100, 240, and 320. So it should be a bit more of a natural feel through there without such an aggressive spike. Hard to say without actually trying them, but really interested in the fact that they're trying to really refine air spring technology. There's a lot of people out there that aren't sold on it and they will still tell you that a coil is the best, but I'm a firm believer that air technology can be as good and it certainly is here to stay. So we look forward to trying some of those in the near future. Now the next bit of tech isn't actually something that new, but it's fairly new on my radar. I want to share it with you because this is a really cool thing. It's called the Toei strap. Now, I was tipped off by this by a friend of mine that works at Renthal. I was in a company that made a chain rings in the hand of us. He's just got one for his kids so he can go riding. And obviously, his kid's quite a good rider. He's got one of those new Canyon bikes. But the problem is, his kid's not quite as strong being, being a young lad. So to help him on the hills, he uses one of these toey straps. And it's essentially a bit of bungee cord with carabiner-style clips on it. One around the seat post, one around their handlebars. Now, the thing that's different about this than any normal sort of towing strap is the stretch that's in it. So it's a much more of a natural sort of pull. So there's no sort of tugging. Have a look on the screen now and you can see a really great bit of footage from the towy site. And you can see how the straps can really benefit a kid out on the trail. They're able to ride a lot further. And more importantly, they can still ride to the top of a hill with a gentle pull that's not gonna feel too unnatural for them. And it means, of course, they're gonna have the energy to really enjoy themselves on those fun downhill sections. I think this is a fantastic way to get kids out on really, really big mountain bike rides. And it could well be one of the sort of keys to future mountain biking for the next generation. Check it out, it's a really, really cool product. And look at the full video 
on their site. The link is in the description underneath this very video. Now, I was recently talking about dropper posts in the world of cross-country racing, in particular the XCO World Cup series, and how it does seem to be increasing, but not at a rate that I thought it would be. But KS, also known as Kindshock, they're their full company name, they're actually making a specific cross-country post. It's carbon fiber, and it's got 65 millimeters of travel, and they have got a whole bunch of teams running this post. Now, I think 65 mil, it may not sound much when, you know, I'm using a post that's got 160 mil drop, by comparison. However, on a cross-country bike, it's all about marginal gains, and that is definitely gonna help riders ride a bit faster in certain parts of the course. Now, the post itself weighs 419 grams, so it's pretty much the lightest one available on the market. It's fully featured with a, a dropper post remote cable on there. Now, teams that are actually sponsored by KS and that are running KS posts in the UCI World Cup now are CST Sand American Eagle, Cross Racing, so that's like Yolanda Neff and Co., Focus XC, KMC Essel Suntour, Absolute Absalon, so that's Julian Absalon and these guys on the BMCs, uh, KS Kenda Women Elite, and of course Gunrita's Merida Gunrita team. So I think it's really cool to see KS really pushing their way into cross country with such a cool product. Have a look at the post on the screen at the moment. So it's, again, it's a super light carbon fiber post. It's called the super light LEV carbon. 419 grams with 65 mil travel. I think that's just a ticket and I really, really fancy one myself, except I don't have a cross country bike at the moment. So I'm thinking of trading in one of my bikes to get a cross country bike because I really wanted to start understanding it a bit more and go back to what I started with in mountain biking. So keep an eye out for this sort of stuff. So I want to look into XC Tech a bit more in the future. Now it's time to have a look at comments, but this week I'm just going to pick out one particular comment because this is a great one. So it's from Jim Rocha. First of all, thanks for the great work on the videos are both entertaining and informative. Cheers, Jim, appreciate that. I was watching your 10 uses for cable ties yesterday and saw how you used them to improvise a way to get home if you damaged a tire. Not bad. I thought you might be interested in an idea I've got for an emergency tire repair method. Our small bike group here in Austria have been doing at least one Transalp multi-day trip each year since 2013, and I'm always looking for ways to save weight in a backpack. On the first two trips, I rode an extra tire. Yep, obviously that sucked. I've since replaced the tire with a small piece of fire hose. It's fantastic for repairing big holes in tires. Now I've done a video demonstrating how well this works. So check this out on the screen now and you can see this in operation. This is actually really, really cool. I'm well into this. So Jim says, I'm no pro downhiller and I'm not airing my bike out like Blake does, but also it wasn't a Sunday afternoon ride from my grandma. The patch works great weighs practically nothing in the backpack and will get you home from the backcountry. Check it out. I think this is absolutely brilliant and this is something I'm definitely gonna try myself. Of course, I did a video recently and showing you how to seal up like tire slashes by stitching them up, patching on the inside, but that's the sort of fix you can end up doing at home. That's not really a trail side fix. Now, Park make these tire boots, which are excellent, but if the tire slash is too big, you're gonna need something better. And I think your fire hose solution is absolutely wicked. So. Thank you for giving us this tip off. And guys, there's a video link in the description below for Jim's video, so check this out and see how he uses this fire hose. Really, really good. If this was GMBN Dirt Shed Show, that would be like king of the hacks, I reckon. But well done, mate. Thank you for that as well. Okay, now it's bike cave time. This is where you guys send in pictures of where you work on your bikes and store your bikes. Could be the front room, could be the garage, could be a garden shed could be the back of the van. Wherever it is, send them in. We'd love seeing where you guys work on your bikes. So first up is a really good one from uh, Charles Scarf or Dave, as the uh, email says. I watch your shows every week and I think it's the best thing since pot noodles were invented. Oh, that's, uh, that's good, I'm a pot noodle fan, so I'll take that as a massive compliment. My name's Dave, I live in South Wales, two miles from Bike Park, Wales. Lucky me, yeah, very lucky, great riding spot that. My man cave has all the fittings for, my, for me to lock myself in for the day and do some hardcore maintenance. Coffee machine, hi-fi, and my MacBook to watch the videos for some needed guidance. All my tools are spread between the orange tool chest and my travel toolbox. I hope you like. I'll tell you what, mate, you've got an awesome workshop here. Nice orange as well, very color coordinated with your orange grips on there, your gold front hub, is that a hope? I guess it is. And then your orange decals on the rock shocks. I don't know if it's a Lyric or a Pike, it's hard to tell from here. Loving the workshop, it looks good. Good looking stereo in there. Nice motocross bike as well. Cheeky, I bet you have some good adventures on uh, Gethin Woodland on that thing, do you? Interesting. You clearly like orange as well, don't you? 
looking at all your crates and your KTM banner up on the wall there behind your tool chest. Loads of stickers on there. I see you're a Mojo fan, so obviously Mojo is now Fox UK, but you're obviously fairly local to those guys, I guess. Well into it. Thank you very much, Dave. Good work, mate. Well into that. And let us know what pot noodles you like. Definitely beef and tomato, man. Next up is from Tim Bellini. Hey, my name's Tim. I'm sending you this from Luxembourg. Oh man, it's so cool getting all these entries from like all these different sort of mountain biking corners of the world. Keep them coming in. I love seeing this stuff. So I love the show, especially the bike, car, bike cave bit. Here's my in-process version of a bike work area. As you can see, I'm working quite hard on road with different teams, so my tools are mainly in my mobile toolbox. Um, Pedro's master toolkit, customized of course, yeah, that's a real nice bit of kit. Uh, maybe you want some of the more of the mobile kit. Not quite a cave, I guess. Well, let's have a look at this here. Oh mate, I'll tell you what, you're super organized. I love the fact you've got those lights lighting up your tool board at the back there. Yeah, and of course you've got your mobile kits. I love those. You see all the mechanics at the World Cup races with those sort of setups. I'm guessing you do something similar to that, looking at the level of tools you've got there. And that's cool as well. Obviously doing a bit of home service in there, some 18 weight RockShox lube there. Uh, RockShox four coil, in fact. Nice Bose speaker tucked away too. Those things sound amazing. They're real good for a man cave. Yeah, I need to do uh, some sort of decent sound system in mine. It's, it's nearly there, nearly ready. I'll be ready to show you it all at some point soon. Nice, good setup, Tim. So many spare parts tucked away in there as well. Let's have a little root for your drawers and see what you've got tucked in there. Um, next up is from Orange O2 Camaro. Uh, don't know what your names are, guys, but um, wow, this is something special, I'll tell you. So this is my bike cave stroke car garage. Me and my dad built it from the ground up, complete with a full line of auto and bike equipment, plus a car lift for getting under things. Yeah, you know, Blake would be jealous of this because he's always having to fix that Jeep of his, so he needs one of these, I tell you. Plenty of room for everything. Oftentimes I find myself working on my friends' cars and bikes for them. I enjoy tinkering and working as much as I like riding. I've got three bikes, 2017 Yeti SB 5.5, 2011 KHS Dirt Jumper. Man, I haven't seen KHS for a while. And a 2015 Giant Road Bike, not pictured. Uh, that's not important, don't need to see that. Oh, I'll tell you what, this is cool though. Man, you've got some serious amount of tools in there. Loads of ratchet spanners. I love those things, but just not that many places we really need them on the bikes. I guess these are all sort of motorsport related for you. Loads of different hammers and club hammers and stuff in there, mallets. Nice, yeah, I like the dirt jump bike, that's really cool. Nice little purple pedal detail there. Although, uh, yeah, it's purple, yeah, nice. All about Yetis. There's something about Yetis, what is it? They've just got that thing, that thing. I like the mechanics wear banner up on the top there. I love that stuff, I've got a pair of mechanics framers gloves with the leather palms. Real good, user working on the house quite a lot, pretty tough. Man, I can't believe you've got a car lift in there as well. A couple of cars just casually thrown in, and a trail dog as well. Oh, absolute winner all the way. Thanks guys for sending those bike cave entries in. Please continue to send them in, absolutely love them. Doesn't matter how good or bad they are, we love all of them because that is the place you get to work on your favorite thing in the world, which of course is, well I hope it is, a mountain bike. So send them in, the email address is on the screen. Of course, you can let us know where they are in the comments below. Send them to us via Instagram, Facebook, all of those channels. Keep them firing in. See you next week. Okay guys, now it is time for Rewind. So this is the retro section of the weekly GMBN Tech Show. Now, usually you guys are sending in pictures of your bikes, weird old forks, helmets, any of that stuff, and we start looking at how cool it is. And we've had loads of entries, but we've actually had a bit of a question this time about the Tioga disc drive. So that was a disc wheel. Now this is from Joel Bartley. Can you tell us a bit about Tioga disc wheels? They were used by both XC and downhill racers in the early days and provided some sort of suspension and an ominous noise. How did the float affect handling and braking? Okay, so for those of you that don't know, the Tioga disc drive was essentially a tension disc. So it replaced the spokes of a bike. It probably weighed a similar amount to those spokes. And it had what they call geodesic webbing. So it was Kevlar webbing to basically lace the wheel together. So it used a conventional hub, a conventional rim, and then it had an adaption kit so you could fit those two tension discs in place. One of the advantages of this wheel system was it had some sort of lateral flex to it which unfortunately I never got to ride one. I always wanted one, but even in those days, they were about 500 quid. They were so expensive. So literally only some of like the top riders that were sponsored had them or people that had a, a lot of money in the 90s. So I can't tell you too much about that. However, 
I know plenty of people that used to race them. So I've reached out to a few of those and I've got some really cool quotes and images for you. So the first one on the screen now is Ian Collins and he's on his way to winning a race in the actual shot. I think it was Eastridge. And he also beat Steve Pete, I think, that year as well. So Ian Collins is the marketing manager at Renthal. So Renthal do the handlebars and the stems and all the cool stuff. And Ian says, uh, I had one back in 93 stroke 94. At the time, I loved it. But I'm sure if I rode one now, I think it was terrible. At the time, I was riding 2.1 tires with a hardtail frame and full saddle height. So the, the bike he's riding there in the picture, uh, in fact, the, the forks are paste forks, just like the ones up on the top of the set here, and the frame is a paste frame as well. Really, really nice, but very, very rigid frame. So he said that in t the advantage, basically, in terms of traction and compliance was the holy grail. It definitely was more compliant over the bumps than anything else, but what he always considered to be the big advantage was the side flex of the wheel, which allowed the tyre to sort of find its way through the rough, helping you gain traction. It seemed to do this without losing any power transfer through that flex. It weighed about the same as spokes, it just cost a hell of a lot more. On the downside, they were fragile. I broke at least two, as far as I can remember. I think the second one I broke, Karate, by that point, had stopped importing them due to the warranty cost. So that was the end of the chapter with me. And despite all of the tech advantages that they did have, the only real reason was they looked cool, they sounded amazing, and Tomac used to run. Of course, John Tomac famously used to run the Tiago disc drive, and the sound was like nothing else you've heard. It was kind of like a rumble. Now, next up was from Dave Hemming. So he was, and still is a, a, an epic rider. He's done multiple Ironman races and stuff now. And he was one of the first medal winners at the World Championships. He was a silver medalist. So he was, I think, Britain's first medalist from uh, World Champ events. Absolutely loved racing on them. They had that bit of give. But let's not forget that this was way before suspension. So it really, really helped. And of course, Dave famously ran them. And then that's kind of reflected by Alan Milway, who's, of course, one of the most famous sort of trainers on the scene. Famously trained the Athertons amongst a lot of other athletes out there. My first live racing memory was watching Dave Hemming fly past a Longmore army camp with a Tioga disc drive. It blew my mind. Amazing noise and the sound of someone who meant business. Yeah, it totally was, it had that sound because you knew it had to be a good rider that had one or someone pretty loaded. I just wanted to play you a little bit of a cool video just so you guys can hear how cool they sounded. Now, it was a film called Tread, that came out in the early 90s, probably 92, 93, and it was essentially a road trip with Hans Ray and Greg Herbold, who now works for RockShox, and they road trip across America in this massive car with a roof rack made of RockShox forks all over the roof, probably about 15 bikes on there. Now this particular clip is Paul Turner, so that to you is Mr. RockShox. He's a guy behind RockShox in the early days, the RS1, the Mag 21, all of those early forks. It's him riding, I think in Hawaii or somewhere near to there, on a GT RTS1 with Mag 21s on it and a Tioga disc drive. And it's just him riding on his own. Check how cool this is. What a clip, it's amazing. So I can't actually find a modern version of it anywhere. I've got Tread as a VHS cassette, which I don't even have a VHS player anymore. Some Someone naughty has thankfully uploaded this to YouTube. So check out this clip and the link to it is in the description below. Very cool piece of kit that was massively overpriced, but more importantly, it was really cool back in the day. Now it's time for Tech of the Week. And this week, I wanna just draw you to something so money saving actually. So bleeding your brakes is a necessity on your mountain bike if you've got hydraulic brakes. You're gonna to have to do it from time to time. Now bleeding kits can be expensive, but there's a company called Epic Bleed Solutions. They make them for Magura Universal Kits. They make from Avid and SRAM brakes, Shimano. They do the lot online. And they're available from just $15.99. And those kits come with the syringes that you need, all the little components and bits and pieces bleed blocks and some of them even come with actual fluid for those specific brakes so I really recommend having a look at that it's a really good solution all-in-one kit for not much money so that's what it's about at the end of the day if it's going to encourage you guys to work on your bikes that's really good I'm really into that but also in the same box they sent us a bunch of these stuff to have a look at check these out fork top cap spanners going from 24 mil to 32 mil I love these because normally you have to use a socket on the top and actually just having a spanner dedicated for your particular suspension fork 
that is tidy well into that so there's a link to epic bleed solutions in the description below this video they're a uk based company but they ship globally so it's a good way to save a few quid and help you on your way to tuning your bike can't be bad so this is just an update on bike build you're gonna have to bear with me for a couple of weeks here because there's a lot of kit to start calling in for this bike i don't want to keep just adding one bit at a time i want to do an extended version and start installing some of that stuff so i've been speaking to x fusion about fork and they can't wait to sort of get us something they're currently building us an all black a brand new sort of 2018 model and there is a slight issue. It's a 20 mil axle. So of course, 15 mil is really popular in mountain biking at the moment. 20 mil less so, unless it's on a downhill bike. So it's a 20 mil axle. So I have to hunt around for wheels to actually reflect that. So if anyone's got any suggestions, what I'm looking for in an ideal world is an all-in-one set of wheels. Mavic, DT, whatever it is. We are open to the option of building wheels for the bike, but I want to get this done fast and this is causing a little bit of a headache. So have a little think about that one for us. But in the meantime, I've been looking at the sort of stuff that Brendan Faircast has been running on his bike. I noticed that both him and the rest of the Scott Velo Solutions team, they're all running those DMR Axe cranks now. So I've been speaking to DMR bikes and actually I'm decided I'm gonna put a set of their cranks on there, but I'm not decided on the chainring yet. So there are options to run a 32 tooth DMR chainring on there. They don't yet make a 34 in boost compatible to fit this frame. But they also, there's Praxis chain rings. Now Praxis are based in Santa Cruz and they actually make sort of chain rings and cranks OEM for all the e-bike part of the industry. So I'm actually quite interested to have a look at that. It's another slightly alternative brand and I have seen their stuff in the flesh. It's beautiful quality. So I'm thinking maybe to go for Praxis for this. And then out back, I've been speaking to the friends of ours at E13. I've probably told you this a million times, but I really love that two-piece cassette, the way it fits. So I'm gonna put one of those cassettes on there. They're actually out of stock directly, so we have to wait a couple of weeks for one of those to get sent over, but that will be going on the back. And I'm just waiting for Neil to bring in the box components, derailleur and shifter before I start putting the rest of that transmission together. In the next week or so, I'm gonna start posting stuff on our social media about some of these bits and pieces just to keep you guys updated. And then hopefully we'll have a bumper edition of Bike Build soon where I actually start building the thing. Okay, there we go. There's another GMBM weekly tech show in the bag. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you've got any comments about the show or any stuff on the show, let us know in those comments below. Love to get involved with all you guys. And of course, if you've got other suggestions for stuff to talk about in Rewind and other parts of the show, let us know or fire them into the email address. For a couple more great videos, click right down here for Anton Cooper's Trek Pro Caliber Pro Bike Check. This thing is a little rocket. It's 29, it's a hardtail, a little bit special though. Make sure you check that one out. And if you want to look at how to sort of spring clean and get your bike sort of dialed in for spring, click up here. Plenty of good ideas just to refresh your bike after an expensive winter grinding away. Of course, as always, click on that globe to subscribe. Nearly at 50K now, help us get up there. And of course, if you like the video, give us a thumbs up.